I'm curious, how many of y'all, uh, simple question, how many have one of these? This is, a, this is a phone. Anybody got a phone? Raise your hand. All right, some of you younger, younger people, like um, maybe not, okay? There's a point at which, right? You don't need a phone until you're a certain age, but uh, we all kind of have a phone. I'm curious, how many of you uh, have, have a home number? Any, and have, how many have a landline at home? Okay, I'm, I'm not, no shame, I'm not dissing anybody. I'm just saying, how many of you have ever, now, now I'm getting, we're going to get older and older as we go, okay? How many ever made a call um, on a, a pay phone? A pay phone. How many of y'all been like in a, in a phone booth? Anybody ever seen a phone booth? You got, guys, have you ever seen a phone booth? No. Have you ever been to London, like got in the red phone booth? Anybody ever done that? It's probably going to stay there forever. Okay, you can, you can do that. Um, how about this? Uh, how many ever used a phone book? Anybody ever used the, wow, a lot of you using the phone book. And see, again, some of our young people are like, what, what is this, like in a museum? Where do we see this stuff? What is this? Um, I mean, think about that. There used to be, uh, like in urban areas in particular, like, man, I need to make a call. Um, let's see, there, I can go down two blocks. I could turn like three blocks. I'd go to the right and then the left. There's a, there's a, there's a phone booth right there and you call your friend like hey bro I'm coming over I'm like dude you could have you could have walked to my house by the time you made this call um but but what happens is with all inventions right I think it was 1873 that the phone no 1876 that the that the phone was actually invented and then 1983 okay, is when the internet was well, some of y'all were alive at this point um 1993 is when the world wide web came along that's usually the date 2007, I think, was the iPhone. Some of you um, deviants who don't have the iPhone showing up green on all the texts, but some of y'all, um, some of you have, have the iPhone. It changed everything. My point is this. There's always these different iterations along the way through history, particularly this easy to track when it comes to technology in our day. 1876, that wasn't that long ago, right? And so what happens is over time, uh, things that were once amazing and, and incredible become obsolete. Like, like ultimately, the, the phone, phone booth, for real, it's going to be in a museum. Phone book is going to be in a museum. Somebody remembers the yellow pages, right? I mean, those kinds of things. Some of y'all, again, like, what is he talking about? Um, this is ancient history now. It's, and so what happens is, it's possible, C.S. Lewis talked about this. He, he called it chronological snobbery, where, where he said, we often think the latest, greatest thing is better than all the other things and all things are obsolete. Now he was talking about one's intellectual climate more so, new ideas, the latest greatest idea is then better than all the other ideas that have come before us. And we can do this with the Bible as well. A lot of people do. A lot of people don't read the Bible, engage the Bible because that's just an ancient text does not apply to today. A lot of people think that way. Here's what can happen. That can dip into the church among Christian type people and we too can, can go there. Because, here's what happens often. Man, that's a tough book. I mean, it's a lot there. And, and, and particularly the Old Testament. It's possible for a lot of us Christians even to go, man, I can't get my mind around the Old Testament. So it's kind of, that's more obsolete. Isn't that just like the law? And now we got Jesus. So what's up with the Old Testament? And, and so what we're doing here as a church always we're in the word all the time. It's why all of us are reading, our dwell reading together as a church family. We're in the same text every day. It's why we have the pastor study where we go, how do you read the text? How can we read the Bible faithfully? We meet on Wednesday nights at 5.30. You can join us. In fact, this week, Dr. Uh, Richard Blackaby, anybody know the name Henry Blackaby? Anybody know that name? Um, wrote Experiencing God. Uh, and his, his son is going to be with us uh, this coming Wednesday night and talk about the role of the Holy Spirit in reading scripture. Critical to understand because God speaks through his holy word. But here's what can happen. We can just kind of disregard, diss the Old Testament and not really understand what's going on there. Here's a key question that you probably weren't asking when you came in today. And it's this. What is the relationship between Jesus, okay, in the New Testament and the old. What did Jesus think about the Old Testament? What does he say about the Old Testament? You're going, yeah, I really wasn't asking that question. But it's so important, every Christian should answer this question. 
What do we do with the law, okay, the Old Testament, now that Christ has come? So important, Jesus addresses it. In Matthew chapter 5, and you've tur- you're turning there, Matthew 5, verses 17 through 20 will be our text for the day, all right? So this is the holy word of God. I'm going to just read it over you. I'm not going to show you the text. I just want to read this over you. Listen to this, the words of Jesus. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot. Some of y'all remember the King James, not a jot or a tittle. That would be like a comma or a dot over an I or over a J in Hebrew. The smallest little marks. He's saying every detail, not one detail will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of these Uh, one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. That's why I took my job, by the way. Like, I I just want to be great. Okay, so this is what I do. Uh, And it's what you can do. We all should do. Teaching the word of God to others. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that, uh uh-oh, of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. So we're three weeks in to this uh, series on the Sermon on the Mount, and it's already making us really uncomfortable. Uh, Things that Jesus says that come right at us. About 10 years ago, a guy named Douglas M. Jones wrote a book, a haunting book, entitled Dismissing Jesus. It's one of these books that I read, and I didn't know what to do with it. It's kind of like the Beatitudes, Sermon on the Mount. Like, I don't even know what to do with this. And in the book, he writes this. This is his, essentially his thesis. Listen to this. I dare you to read this book, Dismissing Jesus. The dominant form of Christian living is one designed to shield us from Jesus' explicit priorities. He says, in our day. How is it that the vast majority of Christians set aside Jesus' obvious and revolutionary call so easily? How do we make disobedience and blindness so normal and acceptable? And then he says this, we simply don't want the way of the cross to actually be what life is all about. It would mean that what most often passes for Christianity is largely a lie, a deception designed to keep us from the way of Jesus. Wow. He goes on to explain in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, we have, we have tamed and declawed the Sermon on the Mount. And I just want to say, I, I know some of your guests today, uh, we have folks, we have folks from France, we got people from Spain, we got people from all over the world. Some of y'all are here for the first time. You need to hear this. Um, we have determined we will not domesticate the gospel or the teachings of Jesus. We will not sanitize the teachings of Jesus. We are going to receive them as they are and we're going to obey what Jesus says and it is a radical way to live. This is why we're devoting our whole fall all the way to Christmas to the Sermon on the Mount. The key question today is what did Jesus say about the Old Testament And why does it matter? Well, we've seen it there. And what we're going to see here, we honor the law. We continue to honor the law. I'll explain all that. Honor the law through worship. We honor the law through obedience. And we honor the law through faith. Okay, so first of all, check this out. Honor the law through worship. Let's dive in. Do not think, he said, that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Okay, This is, by the way, this is a way of saying, this is a summary statement, a way of saying the whole, uh, one of the the commentaries um, by uh, Jonathan Pennington, the best commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, um, the whole gracious story of the Mosaic Covenant with Israel. That's what he's talking about. I have not come to abolish them, that is to dismantle or tear them down, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, interesting, not a jot or tittle, iota or dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished, all right? So how did Jesus fulfill the law? 
What he's saying here, the law and prophets, another place in Luke chapter 24, verse 44, he says this. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you. This is after his resurrection, by the way, while I was with you, still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms will be fulfilled. This is, again, code for the entire Old Testament. Jesus is saying he fulfilled the entire Old Testament. What in the world does that mean? I think most of us understand that he fulfilled the law in regard to his holy life. Like he lived the perfect life. We talk about it all the time here. He's our substitute, not simply our example. He's that. But what we see here, consider how a small seed grows into a giant tree. All right? So the law is the seed. Jesus is the tree in full bloom. So we worship Jesus, we honor the law, how about this, by worshiping Jesus because he's the one that all of it points to. He's the destination. He's the end of it all. He's the fulfillment of it all. He says, I'm not here to relax any of it because there were religious leaders, and you might know this if you've read the gospels, the Pharisees, scribes, among others, uh, they, they were saying he's not following the law. He's way too liberal here. And, and, and Jesus is, is doubling down now. He says, no, no, no. Don't think that I've, I've, I've abandoned the law. In fact, he's going to raise the, the stakes higher and higher. Some of you know in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus enters into his ministry, he starts his ministry, and he's at a synagogue, and he's given the scroll of Isaiah. It was like the reading of the day. It seems that either it was the text for the day, or he turns then to Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61 talks about the Messiah to come. And the Messiah will come and he'll bring, uh, he'll bring what, liberty to, to the captives. He will set the oppressor, uh, the oppressed free. He'll bring sight to the blind. He'll, he'll bring and pronounce the day of, of jubilee, the year of the Lord's favor is what it is. He said, which is a, which is a, co- a very common reference to the Messiah. And then it says he sat down, which then it's like reading the text. Then he enters into the position of the rabbi. And then he says this in, in Luke 4, 24. And he began, okay, so then he's going to start preaching. He began to to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This scripture. Now, thought about this this week. Jesus could have, (laughs) he could have closed his eyes. Today, this this has been fulfilled in your hearing. This right here. Uh, Let's see. Hmm. This is fulfilled in me. And you're thinking, wait, Jeff, like, wait, some of this is history, some of his genre of, of, of poetry. What, 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 what are we talking about that he fulfilled every bit of it? It means that it all points to him. Everything moves towards Jesus, every bit of it. And Jesus is saying, it is all about me. He's the alpha and the omega. We sang about it earlier, gang. Colossians 1.16. Everything was created by him, through him, and for him. Everything. Listen, Jesus is kind of a big deal. And all of scripture And all of history, everything points to him. He's not just another teacher, the best prophet, the best one who ever came along. He did not give us that option. As C.S. Lewis notes, he didn't give us that option. So in John 5, 39 and 40, he's talking to the Pharisees. You might know this, this story. He says to them, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you find eternal life. You think that in knowing all about it, you have eternal life. And he says, but these are the very scriptures that testify about me. And then he says this, you refuse to come to me. See, the scriptures point us to him. And yes, reading scripture is why we do our dwell reading. It's why we need to be in the word every single day because, not simply because, well, I just wanted to learn truths about God's word. I need to know more, the history and more of the content. All that's important. But he, he's saying all of it points to me. Again, it's why we're in the word every day. In, in Matthew 5, 18, did you catch this? He says the Torah is gonna outlast the most enduring thing we can think of, creation itself. 
What's more enduring than creation? The one who created it. God is enduring. Jesus is the one. The Trinity before time. He is the one who created all things for him. Isaiah 40 verse 8 says, yes, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God endures forever. I asked Keith Lowry, our discipleship pastor this week, uh, we started reading Dwell in January 23. And we have now read 32 books 517 chapters, we've read 13,737 verses, all right? And I know some of y'all are like, I, I don't know, I'm not reading. I was reading. I'm reading something else. I'm, I, here's the thing. I want to challenge you again. It's on our website. You can pick, it, pick up a, uh, a journal. But join us as we read as a family together. It's just, you know, just maybe a chapter a day. Because here's the thing. This is what's cool. When we finish reading the Bible all the way through, we're not finished. <laughs> the point, I mean, that's cool, but the point is not to read the whole Bible through. The point is to be in the word every day. And the point is then we're dwelling, abiding in him. Everything recalibrating back to God and his love for us. So we're in the word every day and we're, we're pursuing him. So we worship him. As we honor the law, we worship Jesus. Look at this. Secondly, we honor the law through obedience. But do we still obey the law? Let's, let's get underneath this. We're getting into some heavy theology here. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments teaches others to do the same as least in the kingdom. But who does them, there it is, who actually obeys and teaches them, will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. If you want to be great in the kingdom, do it, obey, and teach others. So Jesus doubles down on this. So the law, God's holy commands, are our enduring authority. Think about it this way. It's like, it's like, a, like a blueprint guides, like say our sanctuary uh, you know, renovation refresh right now. Uh, a blueprint guides all that's happening all the way to the completion of the project. In the same way, the law has guided our lives and continues to guide our lives as we reflect on God's holiness. Now, Jesus, this is important. He, he summed up the entire law. Do you remember this? Pharisees asking him, okay, what's the greatest? They're trying to trick him. What's the greatest command of all? And Jesus says, the great commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, okay, comprehensively. And then he says, and love your neighbor. The second is attached to it. You can't do the first without the second. We, talk, we call this even the cruciform life. We have received his grace we love him, you could say it this way, by loving others, right? I mean, you love God, but God is spirit. How do we love God? What's that really look like? It looks like, looks like the life of Jesus. It looks like loving others. So, so think about this. Most people still believe, I guess in, in, in the West in particular, that the 10 commandments are still in effect, right? I mean, in a lot of cultures, I mean, but here, here's, this is helpful too. You're still, if you're tracking with me here, the moral ethical commands of the Old Testament are still at play. The ceremonial laws, not so much. Because think about this. This is important to understand. The law, okay, the covenantal law was given to a specific people group who were to then follow the law. Some of it's kind of strange to us. They were to follow it. Why? Because it, it made them distinct and holy, separate from other nations. It was given to the ancient Israelites. And I probably need to say this in our day. These are not the, this is not mo the modern state of Israel. We're talking about the Israelites. The modern state of Israel, frankly, um, they, you know, a lot would claim to be Jewish, okay? The Christians that I know personally, there are most often Palestinian Christians who live in the West Bank who are being oppressed big time, by the way. But Israel, okay, as we know it now, is not, it's not the covenantal people of the Old Testament. Don't want to mess with you too much here, but think about it. All of the, the blessings of the law was a covenant agreement with God. And so the, the blessings were always Contingent upon fidelity to the law. What happened? Anybody know their Old Testament? They did not keep the law. Then what happened? They were punished 
the Assyrians, the Babylonians, others came in. They were sent into exile. The temple was destroyed. Even the second temple after Christ's resurrection was destroyed in 70 AD. No sacrificial system. Why? Because Christ was the once and for all sacrifice for all people. Amen? He's the one. And so don't miss this. Christ, again, Christ is kind of a big deal. He came and he was the perfect Israelite. He did what the Israelites could not do. We could add ourselves in the mix. But the ancient Israelites, they could not. They did not keep the law. Christ comes. He is the perfect Israelite, the substitute for the entire nation and all people to come. So now, the watch this, the people of God, the new Israel, is the church. There aren't two tracks of salvation. There's one, and it's through Christ and nobody else. And in no other way. We are not saved by the law or by our good works. We are saved by Jesus Christ and his work done on our behalf. I'm preaching now. Somebody can say amen if you want to. Because this, this stuff, gang, this has changed our lives. This is why we respond in worship to him. And, and he, he, says, he says, listen, I have come to fulfill it all. But here, here's what's, I think, helpful too. Watch for the commands that, that, re, that show up and are affirmed in the in the New Testament. And by the way, nine out of 10 of the commands are repeated in the New Testament, except for the one is the Sabbath. And not because that's a ceremonial law per se, but, and, and then you see that Jesus talked a lot about the Sabbath. He said, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. And then half the book of Hebrews seems to be about the Sabbath. So, but the, but the actual command is, is not found. But all the others are noting that this is, this is forever. Okay, so, so if we love God, think about this. If we love God comprehensively, we're going to, in, in, in regard to the Ten Commandments, love him first. We're going to not kill our neighbors. We're going to love our neighbor. We're not going to covet their stuff. We're not going to steal their thing. We're not going to lie to them. If we love him. So here's what I want you to, to learn. And parents, hang on to this. Kids, check this out. Um, Underneath every law, so let's call it a precept. I want you to see this. Um, a precept is like a rule, okay? So you have a rule, there's a precept, all right? Behind every precept is a principle. Behind every principle points us then to a person. You can do this with every one of the Ten Commandments. And students, uh, children, this is what we're talking about, parents. Um, so you have, a, you have a law, okay? There's a holy command. And sometimes often the do, thou shalt not, you know, kind of thing. We've talked about that. He gives a shout, the, the thou shalt not for two, negative command for two positive reasons. Protect us and provide for us, something better. So the precept is the law. This is the rule. Behind it is a principle. Let's say, let's say, just take a, take a, a, a command. Don't murder. Thou shalt not murder. What's up with that? Okay, that's the law. Don't murder. Why? There's a principle. What is that? Sanctity of every human life. Every person created in the image of God. We've talked a lot about that lately. Behind that, wait, 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 there's a person behind that. The one who is the giver of life. The one who brings life. The one who is life. You see, you can do that with every command. And that's worth noting. And let me just offer this to all of our children and our students here. And parents, you can thank me later. Um, it's this. Here's my point here. Every command comes from the heart of a loving father. We often think, oh, yeah, the Old Testament, that's <laughs> the law, yeah, that. That's some, like the truth, but this is back. And then Jesus comes with grace. He let's go, let's go. Let's hang out in the New Testament. No, no, no. The law is given from the heart of love for us. It's like, it's like parents saying when you're little, don't run out in the street. Oh, mom and dad just hate me. No, no, they love you. They don't want you to go out there and get hit by a car. All of the loving commands and rules that your parents bring to you are because they love you. And the sooner you learn that, the better it will go with you in high school and beyond. Because our parents, we, we, we offer rules and precepts, if you will, laws, follow this, do this, because of our great love. Now, Jesus was Jewish, so he obeyed the Mosaic law. 
He, was, he went to the Jewish temple. He taught and went to the Jewish synagogue. He, he read the Jewish scriptures. We even have proof that he followed the Jewish oral um, laws, even the things, some of the things the Pharisees added. We have evidence that he followed all of it to fulfill it. It's why I often say that Jesus is perfect theology embodied. You know, I, we've said it often. If, you, if you're applying scripture and it doesn't end up with you looking more like Jesus, you're doing it wrong. Because that's the whole point of it all, right? So, so your life is going to look like Jesus. In fact, Paul, a former Pharisee, he writes this, Romans 13, 10. I'm going, to, I'm going to run to a lot of scripture here. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. This is interesting. Because now we move in the New Testament. Let's talk about this. We move to the law of Christ, this is the subversive way and nature of the kingdom. This is how we change the world. Not by powering up on people, not by demanding that you all look like us, act like us, and, and, and obey God like we do. Yes, we desire that, but the way that we point people to that is by doing it ourselves. We don't force it on people. Think about this. I see a lot of Christians who really are, in some ways, demanding even that the Ten Commandments be put up in public spaces. Like, you know, in, in Austin or, or in the classroom or whatever. I'm, I'm all for that. Um, but in a liberal democracy, it also would mean, okay, what about, what about the Quran? You, want, you guys want that up there? Let's do that, Quran. Well, the Book of Mormon or something else. Let's, let's, I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait. My point is this, not so much that. Here's my point. I don't hear any Christians um, demanding that the Beatitudes be put up in public spaces. Nobody's talking about that. Blessed are the meek. And maybe that's why a lot of us aren't, aren't promoting that per se. And if you are, I mean, that's all good. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the humble. Blessed are those who mourn. Bl blessed are those who are merciful. Blessed are the peacemakers. I, I, I don't, and I get it. I mean, I, I get it. The, again, the Ten Commandments may be more universally accepted along the way. Galatians 6.2 says this, bear one another's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 9.21. He makes a clear distinction between the law of the Torah and the law of Christ. He says, I, 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 I want to reach all people. So I become a servant to everyone. So for those who are under the law, okay, Jewish friends, I'm under the law. But, but I, over here, I'm, I'm, under, not, not, I'm under the law of Christ which is a higher righteousness because I'm going to reach those who are outside the law, the Gentiles in particular. And he says, I'm going to just be a servant to everybody. In Romans 13, 8, Paul says, Oh, no one anything except to love each other for the one who loves another, watch this, has fulfilled the law. You tracked him with him there over and over again. Every time the law of Christ is, is referenced in the New Testament, it's all about love. It's loving others so as Paul references the law as a pedagogos as a tutor as a teacher that guides us uh, in in Galatians uh, 3 what he's doing he's saying the law was given to guide us until the fulfillment of it comes in Christ James chapter 2 verse 10 says this for whoever keeps the law or the whole law but fails in one point is guilty of all of it okay so two things going on here one he's saying there's not one law that's more important than another all of them. But he's also saying if you fail at one, you have failed all of them. One sin before a holy God separates us from him. And so Paul says the law was given to us like a mirror to show our sin until we, he says this, until we would be justified by Jesus Christ. And I've, I've said this before. To be justified is to be, it's just as if I'd Never sinned, right? Which is a beautiful translation or way to think about justification. But I've said it too this way. For us church people, more likely, just as if I'd always obeyed every command, every law, because Jesus has done that for me. He is my substitute. So I'm going to close with this. We honor the law through faith. See, Jesus not only accomplished all things, but he also accomplished and finished the punishment for not keeping the law. 
because we can't. So he took it upon himself so that the punishment, there's no condemnation for those who now are in Christ, right? And so honor the law through faith. What does this mean? And this is where we get tripped up. Oh, the faith piece. For I tell you the truth, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom. Now he's, he's throwing shade at the scribes and Pharisees is what he's doing because he says, don't, not like them. It's more than what they're doing. So Jesus, he not only doubled down, he's saying there's a truer righteousness and he's the one who then comes and says, look, it's about internal transformation, not external compliance. You need to receive Christ and when the Holy Spirit comes in you, you move from, I have to do this to I must do this to I want to do this. I want to worship him with my life. R.T. France is a a great um, New Testament scholar. And he writes this, Jesus' teachings deal not so much with the negative goal of avoidance of the wrong, but focuses more on the positive goal is really God's will for his people. You see, this higher righteousness means that I'm going to respond to his grace and it's only grace, friends, listen to this, only grace will give you a pure motivation. Only grace gives pure animation to our obedience in response to his love for us. It's why in 1 Corinthians 1, 30 and 31, Jesus himself has become wisdom from God. He's become our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption. He's a big deal. He's the one. And so we respond to him. Our faith is in Christ, not in ourselves, not in the law. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, I'll close with this. For by grace you've been saved through faith, not your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of work so that no one can boast. So I want to ask you, have you received Christ? By faith, have you received him? If you have not, today is your day. But I want to challenge you with this as well. Faith requires action. And the first step of obedience for you today will be, maybe you didn't come here planning on this, but the spirit of God is speaking right now. So we're going to give time to respond right now before we run out, before we leave. We're going to sing a song together and I want to challenge us. Our team's going to come out now and listen, I want us to focus our hearts now. This is very important. And I want you to consider your response to the message today. That Christ has done all of this. So what are you going to do? Maybe, you know, the great testimony that Sam has brought to us this morning is, is what you need to do, as Caleb noted. That you would come to faith in Christ. You already have, perhaps. It's believer's baptism. We believe. Then we say, He's Lord of my life. It's the first public profession of your faith. And I challenge you, like so many have done in recent days, to respond. And if you want to come and talk to us today, I'm, I'm going to be right over here. During this song, you can move and go right over here. I'm going to be out here with others who can join you. If you need prayer today, we'll be right over here. If you want to join the church, we'll be here. But you can do it during this time. And listen, again, Caleb noted, if you want to be baptized, you can, you can see it on the screen. Next week, we're going to baptize uh, a bunch of people out in the front lawn. You can be a part of that. Uh, we're going to baptize in the days to come as we've done today. You can text that 74899. Text baptism to that number, okay? And do that like a lot of people have in recent days. And we'll talk to you. That will be your step of faith, okay? So let me pray and then we're going to sing before we go. You respond, Lord, we thank you. You are amazing. Your grace is amazing and we stand in awe of you. And now we respond to this assurance that we have of our salvation. And we praise you for it. May it ring in our hearts and ears throughout our week, throughout the days ahead. And may we all respond, Lord, for those who need to respond with baptism, salvation. Join in the community of faith. May it happen even now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.